Meghan Markle, a liar, manipulator, and a fraud. That is a conclusion you can reach after reading some of the excerpts from Tom Bauer's new book about Harry and Meghan and their battles against the royals. And it really is quite revealing about who Meghan actually is and how really she tried to pull one over on the whole world. And really the only person buying it, truly buying it within the royal family is unfortunately her husband, Prince Harry. Hello everyone, welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany and I talk about everything related to royals. So that's news, gossip, fashion, jewelry, television shows, movies, and history. So if you wanna subscribe, that would be great. And I apologize for my interesting setup today. I actually had to go out of town for a brief little bit, but I wanted to make sure I got this video because I saw this article and I read through and I was like, oh my gosh, my feelings about Meghan Markle have been completely vindicated. I was not crazy. And obviously, you know, you can take this interview with a great, you know, this book with a grain of salt if you want to, but this author is very well known for digging very hard and it's coming from Vanity Fair. So there's actually two articles about this that came out in the Times of London. So this is a very reputable newspaper in the UK and they are releasing excerpts from this book. And the first one is kind of about Harry and his time at Prince Philip's funeral. Kind of the famous quote from that is that the queen allegedly said told AIDS, she's so glad Meghan Markle was not there. And I think that speaks volumes. I don't think anybody in the royal family really likes Meghan Markle. And nor do I think they should, because I think she basically spent most of her time dating Harry, lying to them. And we can just see a snapshot of this in this Vanity Fair, sorry, this interview, which included the Vanity Fair piece. So I'm gonna do another video about Harry's betrayal, but I wanted to talk about this Vanity Fair interview section excerpt, this Vanity Fair interview excerpt, which I thought was just fascinating and just confirmed so much of what I thought about Megan basically from the jump, that she lies, she manipulates people, and she's just generally a fraud. And you know what, she actually admitted this on a panel about suits, that she did not have actually her SAG card, and she went to the, the audition knowing she didn't have it, and she laughs and she tosses her head back going, I'm such a fraud. And you know what, Megan, now kind of the whole world is beginning to catch on that yes, you are a fraud. And this is not something, please understand, this is not something I take, I mean, I take some pleasure in it because my instincts were right. And that is always nice to feel. But it's, you know, there are children involved, there's a marriage involved. And if Megan really lied to Harry a lot about who she was, her intentions, you know, there's, there's a lot of lives involved in this. And that's incredibly sad, but I'm going to go over first and foremost, this excerpt, because again, I find this, I was like, oh, this is so juicy. Thank you. Because it confirms so much of what many people thought and figured about who Megan is. So kind of the number one thing, you know, I have, you know, kind of three sections I'm going with. Number one is that Megan lies to get her way, to portray herself in a way that she is not. And this became, this is very apparent in the Vanity Fair interview because she lied in two different ways, major lies in two different ways. She told Buckingham Palace and Harry she would not talk about him in the interview. And she told Suits that she was, that this article was basically gonna come out around this, you know, their 100th episode and it was gonna be a great coup for the, the, the program and everything. And so that was really kind of interesting because neither one of those were true. So she gets down and she starts doing this interview and I'll get to the whole manipulation, manipulation section next, which is quite fascinating with the author of this article. But she starts out and she is explaining to, you know, they're doing this interview and the palace and Harry had been very specific. Don't talk about us. Don't talk about our personal relationship because, you know, girlfriends have done it in the past and it hasn't worked out well for them, including his own mother and his aunt. So Diana and Fergie. And so Harry just, but Megan went ahead and was like, she didn't care. So all of a sudden they're talking and the author goes ahead, the author of this article goes ahead and turns to her and asks, tell me about Harry. He was not expecting an answer because again, they had already discussed this ahead of time. If you do interviews with people generally, not all the time, but high profile people generally, they know what the interview questions are. This is not always the case. I've actually interviewed a lot of people and I usually don't provide them with questions unless they ask because I'm not going to, I'm not a gotcha interviewer. I'm not going to try to dig into your deepest darkest 
deepest, darkest secret. I just want to, I, you know, I'm asking you about your book, about your life, about your family, about your work, something to that effect. So, you know, that Megan had kind of a high, was a bit a high profile because she was dating Harry. He knew that her relationship with him would be kind of off limits, but like any good journalist, he did go ahead and ask. And this is what she said. We're a couple, we're in love. Megan replied into the audio, into the recording device. Clearly prepared, she balked when asked, what does love mean? Lo that question is famous. It was asked to Prince Charles when he and Diana first announced their engagement. They were doing an interview and he's like, whatever love means. <laughs> so uh, everybody knows that was a sign of things to come, but Megan apparently was prepared. She eventually uttered, I'm sure there will be a time when we will have to come forward and present ourselves and have stories to tell. But I hope what people will understand is that this is our time. This is for us. It's part of what makes it so special. That is just ours, but we're happy. I love a great love story. Bravo, clearly, clearly prepared. But of course, Buckingham Palace was furious. Harry was a bit mad as well. And she got kind of flack from everyone about this. And then she's like, oh, well, what did they all expect me to do? Apparently Megan called Kevin Sunshine of the eponymous and rather very, very aggressive PR agency, Sunshine, Sunshine Sachs, which Megan, you know, employs to basically put her in the news all the time, even though she claims she doesn't watch the news, like the news or want to be in the news. It says, within hours, Megan called Ken Sunshine and Thomas Morgan. Hysterically, she described Buckingham Palace's fury at Wild about Harry, the title of the piece, which she did not like, and the palace did not like. But again, there's a reason why. Sunshine Sachs, Megan said, should have ensured that her comments about Harry were removed. Why wasn't the focus on her philanthropic, philanthropy and activism? We'll get to that. So apparently though, this is funny, Sunshine Sachs apparently decided that they would go and threaten Vanity Fair with going, the, the queen is gonna call you. And the monarchy's like, no, no, we don't call her. Because basically they made their bed, they had to lie in it. And I think again, I, I feel sorry for the palace and the royals to a certain extent because somebody like Meghan, until you've dealt with somebody like her, until you've lived with somebody like her, you just, you don't know how to do it. You don't know how to react to somebody like her. Somebody who is constantly manipulating, lying, you know, basically does none of the good person things that normal people do. She's always self-serving. One of the other lies that she told, and this is again, I always called hogwash on this. From the first time I heard it, it made no sense to me whatsoever. Just from a logic standpoint, I didn't even know much about Megan. It's just the story again, just rings false. So when she first kind of came out and hit the stage as Harry's girlfriend, there was a story that as a child, she had written to Procter and Gam in Gamble a, about a soap dish commercial saying that it was sexist. And she basically, you know, said that you should pull this. And she wrote to Hillary Clinton. And wouldn't you know it, they immediately pulled it based on her advice. And Hillary Clinton also, because, you know, Meghan Markle is the best. Hillary Clinton wrote her back. Well, apparently Vanity Fair could not confirm a single word of that story. They put their fact checkers on it. They apparently even utilized the services of, they consulted PNG and advertising historians. So this commercial was pulled, but probably from, you know, either a vast outcry or somebody high up when the company kind of saw it, or maybe even the CEO's wife's like, uh, because it was kind of sexist towards women is how it was portrayed. I haven't seen the commercial, so I can't speak to it, but that's kind of the, the allegation. And they looked at it and go, mm, no, it's, it's not really. So again, that's a huge thing that Megan's hung her hat on. She's, she's done, she shared this story countless, countless times but apparently it was all a lie. Or, although there is this little note, the success of her quote unquote campaign was fictitious, invented by an adoring father. So another Megan line, that her father did not care, did not support her, didn't do anything. All of a sudden we have contradictory proof that he basically kind of did a Santa Claus situation telling her that she did this, 
which she didn't actually, but somehow as an adult, she still believes it. You know, just logic should make you realize that if you're eight years old and you send this letter, I can't remember how old she was, eight, nine, 10, something like that. No company is going to change their multi-million dollar advertising campaign based on the word of an eight-year-old child, nine-year-old child, 10-year-old child, whatever. They're not gonna change it because there's millions of dollars at stake. There has to be either a huge outcry or somebody high up in the company enough to say, I want this redone and then they will do it. They won't do it just because a little girl tells them they should redo it. Yeah, they, that, that's not how the world works. So it's nice to actually hear that Vanity Fair, which Megan wanted that story in the piece, they didn't put it in because they couldn't corroborate a word of it. So props to Vanity Fair for that. But that it's taken this long to come out that this whole story was a lie is insane. It should have come out much earlier than this. And the other correction, they did actually make one correction to the article. They didn't really make any other corrections to it. So I will say hats off to Vanity Fair for not just bending to her will. Because I mean, at that point she was, I mean, she was dating Harry, but she was a low tier actress. She was a low tier actress. So they have no reason to like bend over backwards to please her really. So they did make a correction. There was speculation that until mid-July, she was living with the chef, Corey Vitt Vitello. And Megan explained that she met Harry in July 2016, not May. The magazine published the change. Now there's always, always been questions about the timeline of, Mary, of Megan's relationship with Corey and Harry and did they overlap. Corey, to his credit, hasn't thrown her under the bus if that's true. But this does raise some questions that if Megan, again, because if you think of her kind of like Amber Heard, they lie because they believe they can get away with the lie. And so they don't really keep track of the lie. They're not good enough to really, you know, actually they'll say two different things. So it's entirely true. It could be true that Harry and Corey did overlap and Megan did not break up with Corey until she was pretty sure she had completely hooked Harry. When it comes to the suits, a hundred thing, suits, I guess, hardly came up in the piece. I have to look it up again. So even though it was their hundredth issue, there, it was really not mentioned because again, suits was not important to Vanity Fair. They just wanted Megan. So it was kind of, you know, in a way, a bummer for suits because she kind of told them, hey, this is a, we can plug our show. Isn't this so great? And then that kind of totally fell apart. And then we get to the fraud section. And again, this is, I keep, this struck me from day one. It was just so annoying. And it's, I'm finally glad there's some truth here that Meghan Markle wanted herself portrayed as this great actress and a strong philanthropist. They want, she wanted them to focus on her philanthropy, that she was um, philanthropy, that she was this great global philanthropist traveling around the world. And again, that's fraud, she's, that's not who she was. She went on one trip for World Vision, actually technically two, but one before she met Mary, Harry, one after. And basically, if you look at the pictures from that World Vision tour, it looks like just a photo shoot with orphans. You know, it's almost offensive. She's, you know, it just seems like a, just a, a big photo shoot for her. That's how she, that's I think how she saw it was this great way to kind of, and I loved how they put this in here too. So this was a great quote that Megan, they could find no evidence of her global philanthropy or for her activism. And they said, Hollywood philanthropy is PR philanthropy. Graydon Carter often observed. So basically her philanthropy, her activism is basically a giant publicity stunt. There's no, effort or intention behind it. It's a giant publicity stunt. And this is, you know, something I always thought that she's one of those people who only does good works because it benefits her in some way. She doesn't do it because she wants to. She has to do it and it has to be demonstrative. Part of the reason she didn't like being royal is that she couldn't always publicize the great work she was doing. She thought she was doing. So it's just, again, something that, you know, I always thought about Megan and this book kind of confirms that. And I think, again, that this is not only being corroborated by the author of the book, but he's citing Vanity Fair sources directly, tells me that this is true. You don't cite Vanity Fair sources by their name if they said it would have been all off the record. This was clearly on the record. 
So again, Meghan Markle, she's a fraud. She wanted to be considered this good actress. She wasn't. They had no reason really to plug suits. Like the only reason they cared was that she was dating Harry, but she was convinced they were interviewing her basically because she was this great actress and philanthropist. But kind of the biggest thing, and one of the, like, it was just when I read it, I was just like, I bet you she does this to everyone. She did this to William, probably even to Charles. Any man in the royal family that she needed to get on her side, she probably tried to pull the stunt with. And it was almost shocking what she did to this author of this piece. So he says they had started off the day and she had baked him a, <laughs> she'd baked him a cake. <laughs> so the author was Sam Kastner and he was, you know, tasked with interviewing her. And the first thing he said, he's flying to Toronto and he says, quote unquote, I don't have, I don't know who this woman is. Love that he uses this woman. I don't know who he is. And contrary to Omid Scobie's assertion that Megan wanted to tell the world I'm in love and did the interview with Harry's blessing, Kastner arrived at Megan's home and was told that his interviewee was under strict orders from both Harry and Thomas Morgan. Aware that Diana and Sarah had destroyed themselves in interviews, Harry had ordered Megan to maintain tight-lipped silence about sensitive topics. Donald Trump raised their relationship and especially himself. He was not to be mentioned. So. Kastner arrives to this house, not really knowing <laughs> totally probably why he's there and who this woman is. And she begins to prepare him lunch because, you know, she's a foodie. And she's like, she went to the local garden. She baked him a cake, apparently. As she darted in and out, pummeling him with questions about his school, marriage, and work, Kastner began to sense a reverse of roles. Looking around, Kastner noted, noticed that the kitchen walls were covered with photos of herself and the books piled on the coffee table were picture guides and history books of London. Only the A to Z of London streets was missing, he thought. Uncertain whether she had actually read any books about Britain, even before they sat down to eat, Kastner felt uneasy. Both knew that a lot was writing on this interview, and both understood that the critical issue of Harry had been vetoed. Megan spoke, he realized, knowing that she had the winning ticket but avoiding giving an impression of triumphalism. Megan spoke about my speech at the UN and her success as an 11 year old against Procter and Gamble. As a child, Megan had written to the company's chairman and Hillary Clinton, then first lady to complain about the slogan promoting the washing up liquid that said, women all over America are finding greasy pots and pans, urging that it should be changed to people all over America, bowing to thousands of protests PNG eventually changed the line. Kastner thought to himself, it's hard to know if she's genuine. She's an actress. She also said, every day at school for 10 years, I was on the set of Married with Children, which was a really funny and perverse place for a little girl in a Catholic school uniform to grow up. Kastner could not know that Thomas Markle insisted that the studio visit was her Friday treat. Now this is where it gets into that manipulation thing. I mean, it started before Kastner was uneasy. He, he just was feeling her out and feeling, I think that she was a fraud. He was already seeing through her act. And, but this is where it goes from, okay, you know, maybe she's, she is an actress, she's playing a bit of a role. This is where it hits kind of mission critical, really. You're not the typical journalist, Megan said coyly. I like you, especially your stuttering. Kastner felt he was being played. It was a cat and mouse game, he reasoned, and she was calculating how to take advantage of the cards played. She won't hit her goal by ge being genuine, he concluded. After lunch, she kicked off her shoes, tucking her legs on the seat. Megan visibly relaxed, and to Kastner appeared sexy. This was the moment to pry. And this is where he asks questions about Harry. Now you read through that and A, I just feel slimy reading it. Honestly, it just seems slimy to me. And I think it's very clear that Megan was utterly manipulating Kastner and she probably used the same playbook on Harry's friends 
on his, you know, family. Because if she's doing that to a reporter she wants something from, you bet your bottom dollar she did it to the rest, anybody else she needed to. She manipulates men by using, it seems, not saying this for sure, but if this little section is right, to me what that tells me is that Megan is utterly comfortable using her sexuality to manipulate men. Obviously women do have done that throughout history, often to the doom of men. This generally doesn't go very well for the men when this happens. So Harry, that's something to consider. But that's just, it's just not, it's just cringy and kind of gross. And it's like everything was a means to an end. Has she ever been genuine in her life? I have no idea. I have no clue if this woman has ever been genuine in her life. But she clearly, I think, manipulates men. And she, I think, enjoys it. And I think we can see that right here. And it gets kind of worse. And it gets kind of worse, believe it or not. So, and just to, another note I forgot to mention, it says over the next few days, Kastner called those who Megan had recommended as her friends. The tennis player, Serena Williams, denied she was Megan's friend, but an acquaintance. Of course, and Megan's is only friends with people she can take advantage of and she sees them as friends where they see her as an acquaintance, acquaintances and her true friends are people who are just as their users like she is. They manipulate other people, they grab onto other people who are more famous than them to try to make themselves more famous. Megan just found a sucker. Apparently though, Serena said in an enigmatic quote, you've got to be who you are, Megan, you can't hide. Kastner's unease grew. Soon after he returned to New York, Megan sent him spices from the market. Megan's snow job, he decided. So a snow job is an intensive effort as persuasion or deception. I had to look that up because I wasn't sure exactly what that was, but that is, so she was trying to manipulate him. So after kind of the hubbubaloo over Megan talking about Harry in the interview came to light, she called Kastner and this is what she said. I thought this could have been an actual friendship. I don't no now think that can happen. Kastner, she implied, had queered the deal with Harry. Kastner was puzzled. How could she hate a blatant puff piece? And then her feelings were explained. Of course she hated the title Wild About Harry because she was promoting her philanthropy. She was equally furious that her battle with P&G was omitted. Kastner resisted revealing vanities various fact, checker, fact checkers had raised questions about the accuracy and after consulting P&G and advertising historians had concluded that they could not prove the whole story. He said she complained because she wasn't presented in the way she wanted. She demanded that the media do exactly what she expects. I felt manipulated. You know, I think a lot of people who have interacted with Meghan Markle probably feel the same. I don't think that's an isolated incident. She is all about herself, her own self-interest. She could care less about Harry. I don't know where her children fit into that spectrum, but Meghan is all about pleasing her own ego. Ego. She's all about getting, becoming famous. It's all about greed. And she's willing to manipulate people to get there. So if you think about it, you know, she manipulated the author of the Vanity Fair piece, probably manipulated or tried to manipulate members of the royal family, tried to manipulate Harry's friends, and they all saw through it and they all tried to warn him that she was bad news. And it wasn't just that they questioned her intentions and integrity. What if she hit on them, basically? What if she did? We, we don't have any proof of that. I'm just speculating. But you can make that inference that she does this heavy flirtation to try to manipulate men into liking her. And weak men like Harry totally fell for it. The rest of his, and I partly, they didn't, the other men didn't fall for it is because they knew she was attached to Harry. And I'm sure she did that to William. He would be a utterly taken aback and shocked and completely like, uh, no, you need to stop doing this right, right now. Don't care right now. How much has, and you look at this and you gotta wonder, how much has Harry been manipulated, gaslit, 
lied to, you know, show, like told all these false stories. I mean, is anything Megan told him 100% true or is it all a landmine of lies, half lies, half truths? And there is their entire marriage based on sand. Can it completely collapse? Because some things that Megan told him are utterly untrue. And again, that goes back to the reason why Harry probably never met Thomas Markle. Harry didn't meet Thomas Markle because Megan was ashamed to meet for Harry to be introduced to him because he's an awful human being. No, she was ashamed, not ashamed. She was, she did not want her and her, she did not want Harry and her father to meet because he knew the truth and she could not rely on him to lie for her. Because I would bet most people that Megan keeps close to her, not real close, not Serena Williams, not Oprah Winfrey, you know, perhaps her mom, some of her closest friends like Jessica Mulroney, she could rely on them to lie to Harry, to gaslight him into believing things that just weren't true. And it's just sad. Harry's lost his relationship with his family, his perhaps place in history, his title, his children's titles, his relationship with the, the only brother he will ever have, his nieces and nephews, his immediate family, extended family. He has lost his, you know, a huge, she has cost him so much for what? To chase fame in Hollywood? Fame is fleeting, beauty is fleeting. What they're chasing will never end up in a good place. So I look at this and I just, A, just feel satisfied that my instincts were right, gotta say. But I also look at this and I see that a woman who was not supremely intelligent, I see a woman who managed to get her hooks into a deeply damaged man and who was ripe for manipulation. And she took that and she twisted him up to make him abandon his family, his home, his country, everything. So she could finally achieve her Hollywood dream. Because it is clear from that article, she still, she wants her Hollywood dream, I think. That's the other thing too. So anyways, guys, let me know what you think of this video. I apologize that the audio and video is not great. Again, I'm doing this on my iPad instead of my camera with my microphone. So it's probably not the best, but if you guys want to subscribe as well, that would be great. And again, I'll be doing a part two, probably to air on Sunday, kind of about the side we learned about Harry and his interview with his documentary with Oprah and how he basically betrayed his family while trying to seem like he was making amends. So guys, again, thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.